So hello, Mark Elenowitz. Really good to have you here today. Thanks for having me, Roger. It's uh, exciting times for your company. We're glad to be here to uh, help support you. Yeah, absolutely. And your company too. Uh, in fact, before we go into uh, the purpose of this call, which really is very much around the future of markets, what Upstream is doing, what, and your vision. Uh, let's jump into something that people are talking about like right now, which is that we just did this um, NFT coupon. Uh, obviously, we've been talking it through, but I don't think people are aware of just how uh, new this is, right? And in terms of you know us being, I think we're the first NYC company that's using this right now. So I'd love for you to just give people a bit of an overview of like, you know, the the kind of revolutionary nature of what you put together and and us coming on board to be using this with you right now. That's great. Thank you, Roger. Uh, so, so let me just give you a little background on Upstream. So Upstream, we are a national securities exchange. We are we work with a, a partner in the Seychelles called Merge Exchange Limited. And, and Roger, one of your companies is listed there. And Merge and Upstream is the digital side of Merge. We're an app-based market that's designed to allow global investors from around the world to be able to be a, download an app be able to go through a KYC process and open an account and use credit card, PayPal, cash. And we also take cryptocurrency in the form of a USDC stablecoin. So we've created the ability for using alternative asset classes like Bitcoin and ETH that can be then swapped into uh, USDC to now be able to buy traditional equities. So the question is, how can we do that? What's unique about Upstream is that we are a, an exchange and marketplace that's powered by the Ethereum blockchain. So that gives investors a great deal of protection because it allows investors to be able to participate in orderly, in a clear and a transparent and in a, uh, in, excuse me, immutable manner. What I mean by that is that every trade, every action is recorded on the blockchain and investors are able to go and see on Etherscan every single trade. So our market has no market makers. It's designed to allow individual investors to be able to put in their best bids and best offers, have a transparent order book, and allow the securities not to have the market gyrations and manipulations that occur in other capital markets, because we don't allow layering or spoofing or any of the predatory practices. Because it's on the blockchain, we don't allow anybody to short, hypothecate, or borrow. Our transactions settle T0, or the term is atomic swap, which means it's instantaneous. And it removes the friction of settlement that occurs in the traditional markets. So when you buy something, you own it immediately. And when you sell something, the cash is available to you instantly. What Upstream is designed to be is the Robin Hood of the rest of the world. And your company, you're offshore, and you have a lot of investors from around the world that want to be involved with your company, but they cannot buy the shares. It's difficult. We take it as Americans for granted that we could go to an E-Trade or Schwab or Fidelity and open an account online in a matter of minutes. That concept doesn't exist to the rest of the world. The concept of being able to trade from your phone doesn't exist. We saw during the Robinhood uh, phenomenon back in 2020 during COVID, when everyone was trading stocks from their home and we saw all these you know, crazy things happening in the market, the rest of the world stood by and said, we don't get that chance. So upstream is, in, in essence, the Robin Hood for the rest of the world. Can I can I just jump in right there? And I'm, I'm going to get back to the NFT question in a moment as well. Yeah, I, I, I know I didn't answer you. I was heading that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Because everything you said is the reason that like, I, I was so interested in working with you because so much of what you're saying is exactly what retail investors and CEOs have said for a long time. They're like, why can't we just change the market? Why can't we just make you know use of the blockchain? decentralized trust and like because that's where all the issues are with the existing organization now i want to just pick up on robin hood before we go back which is yeah. robin hood also everyone thought was like this is great like even the name robin hood like hey is is about basically robbing for the rich and giving to the poor and just leveling the playing field what happened with gamestop and what happened where basically the uh, the stop was put on the on the buys but not the sells um that clearly basically was a uh, loss of trust right where people were like okay well clearly there's there's too much vested interest for us to even trust Robinhood right now. Can you just talk a bit towards that? I'm gonna to get to your future, your background a bit later and your future sure. vision, but just from the point of view of how how we stop like some big company somewhere coming in and uh, taking over. Well, I think it comes down to this. Uh, 
if you look at the blockchain industry as a whole, and one thing to, to, to point out to everybody that's listening, there's a major difference between crypto and blockchain. We are a securities exchange that's powered by the blockchain, which is a ledger. We are not a crypto market. We don't trade cryptocurrencies. We're not an ICO. So the marketplaces like FTX and Gemini and Voyager and the companies that have gone through these, these issues over the last few months, and it's even FTX was a great company, but bad actors that were running the company. That's not the case of what we're talking about. If you look at the New York Stock Exchange, which is owned by ICE, you look at Goldman, you look at, mar at all of these, these market participants, they're all moving towards creating blockchain settlement because it is immutable, it is instantaneous, and it's trustworthy. So our barrier to entry is we're three and a half years in the making. We attempted to try to do it in the US, but the US market's not ready for this yet. But the rest of the world is adopting it. And we're starting to see bonds trade this way and other types of instruments trade this way. So we will eventually see, I think my belief is in, in the next five to 10 years, all markets around the world will be settled through the blockchain. We're already trying to see it with title settlement and insurance and other types of products. So what happened with, with Robinhood is it was a situation that related to uh, net capital and deposits and other things that were really out of the control of Robinhood itself. We can't really pick on them too much. But in our marketplace, we don't have those constraints because we don't custody cash. Cash is actually custodied at a bank. All investors that open accounts with us have segregated individual bank accounts. We are not a U.S. broker dealer. We're not a U.S. exchange. We don't allow Americans today to be able to buy and sell, but we do custody that cash in the U.S. because the U.S. financial system is one of the strongest in the world. So we don't have to worry about being an offshore entity that suddenly all the money is going to disappear because if something happened to us, an investor can go directly into the bank. When you take the other side of it, which is settlement, we have an asset held away model. And this is the beauty of what the blockchain is. So we are a centralized marketplace, but we're truly DeFi and we're really Web3, which was where the future is going. So investors that open accounts with us are actually opening a wallet and the wallet has biometric security. So the investor's asset is held, that security, that stock is held directly in the wallet. And it's akin to the concept of an asset held away. Like grandfather gave you shares at Disney. And you know you got the one share when you were born and it was sitting in your drawer and you forgot about it and you lost it. You can actually go back to the transfer agent and sign a loss certificate affidavit and have it replaced. Our gatekeeper is that transfer agent. Our marketplace is, is designed for investor protection, transparency, and ease of use. So, so I'm going to come back to the NFT and then we're going to continue on this. Uh, yeah. When I saw that you did the Jupiter Wellness uh, NFT, right? As yes. a component, with this, we were going through a lot of challenges with the NYC. Not because they weren't trying to be helpful, because they actually were very helpful in getting us uh, basically through all the compliance with yourselves. But from the point of view that if we were to do a special dividend, there was going to be a long time period, especially if it was going to be something like an NFT, because they had to go through all these approvals. But if it could be done as a coupon, then it could be done much faster, because it effectively wasn't something which was you know treated the same way as special dividend. Uh, and without going technicalities of that. When you went through how you were doing the coupon with um, uh, with Jupiter Wellness, I was like, all right, this is going to work for us. Now, they're based on NASDAQ. We're based on NYC. I uh, would love for you to share you know, just sure. your vision of these kind of coupons and how it really helps companies like ours. So coupons have been around for years. Most people don't realize that if you own some of the Fortune 500 companies, there are benefits that you get as a shareholder. Berkshire Hathaway is a classic example. If you own shares of Berkshire Hathaway, you get discounts on insurance and other products if you're a shareholder. So the concept of what the digital coupon is, is it's a reward to shareholders. Shareholders have been buying stocks, like Jupiter Wellness as an example. There are shareholders that have been purchasing the stock that believe in what management's executing and want to be a participant in that growth by being a shareholder. But they've actually never tried the product. And what the digital coupon does is it rewards the shareholder to now go and sample the product. The beauty of the blockchain and the beauty of NFTs is NFTs are evolved, not the nonsense of a picture of an ape or a pixelated picture of a, a CryptoPunk 
What we're talking about is utility function of a non-fungible token that's not a security. It doesn't fall under the Howey test. It has no economic ownership in the company, no dividends, returns, all the things that are the bad things related to NFTs. These are purely utility where you have the ability to convert a digital item using our technology into a physical product. So with Jupiter Wellness, all shareholders of record, regardless whether you own the stock on Upstream, on NASDAQ, if you have it directly with the transfer agent, you're treated as one class, one, one group, and you're rewarded for your participation where you will receive a coupon. The coupon is on Upstream. Everyone can come and redeem it, or the term is claim it. If you're a shareholder, this is what we're going to be doing with you, where, uh, where those shareholders will have a record date. And I believe we announced it was February 28th. So if you're a shareholder of GNS, then you will be uh, memorialized on the blockchain that you now are entitled to this coupon. You can come to Upstream and claim your coupon and then redeem your coupon directly with your company where you're able to exchange that for a good or service. And the concept is if you, going back to Jupiter Wellness, if you try the product, you realize the product is beneficial to your health, you will go out and then buy that product in the stores or directly from the company which in turn will drive revenue and create economic value for the company and ultimately reward shareholders because the company is able to expand its shareholder base so you're, or, and customer base. So you're really, if you think about it, what you're doing is you're taking a shareholder and making them a customer. And ideally, you want a customer who realizes how good your product is to eventually become a shareholder. It's a reward system to benefit everyone. Yeah, and, and in our case, we... Already before we had our IPO, we were 100% funded by uh, our community, right? We didn't have a single VC. We didn't have any institutional investors. It was all funded over the years by people that are our students, who are our partners, and then said, hey, I want to be an investor in this as well. And just because we have a philosophical view, right? A lot of people, I think, you know, become public companies because they're just trying to access the institutional markets. In our case, it was always about the retail investors because like what better way, given that most of us were unhappy with our education system, than to have an education system where you are part owner in. Uh, and if it can be successful, then you're actually you know, sharing in that success of it as well. And you get to have a say as to what the future of it will be. So that was always the intention to begin with. Obviously, like what has become uh, you know, a big part of our crusade has been, you know, how do we actually root out bad actors uh, you know, on, 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 you know, through the um, stock market? Um, and again, this is something which this doesn't do it quite the same way as something like what we're doing with the entrepreneurial resorts uh, spinoff, where every, every broker is forced to have to say how many shares they have, and we can just you know see if there are counterfeit shares or whether they have to cover them. Uh, but in this case, yeah, if you had a broker that's issued more shares than they actually should have, that's going to become clear as people start to then say, "Look, I want my I want my uh, coupons." Um, and so it kind of does both things. It it hope like hopefully is going to make a difference to basically you know brokers saying, "Look, we should be kind of playing the game right here." But it also then, as you say, gives all of the uh, different um, you know shareholders a chance uh, to then actually you know get benefit from this too. So I just want to add one extra piece in here as well, which I think is super interesting, which is that we set up our gems, which is our student credit, right? Like our idea was always, look, we don't want to be in a situation where we're just you know exacerbating student debt, which is at ridiculous levels right now. Uh, but student credit is about how do you earn and learn at the same time, so you're getting credit you can then use on additional programs or. Uh, investing in companies and so on in the future. So it was always the idea it should be something which is more like a cryptocurrency. But after be having our IPO, it was very clear that would not pass SEC regulations. And we pretty much just made it something that you could not uh, trade. You could just earn it the same way as Air Miles. Uh, and that's why we also, with, uh, with the NFT token, said, look, we want to make sure it's a coupon that isn't tradable or isn't saleable. So we don't run afoul of SEC rules as well, right? Do you think in the future... Uh, and this might be an unfair question because it's not about, it's about the SEC, but do you think in the future, you know, that like more of the different, um, you know, institutions around the world that are managing markets will see the value in something that's not just non-fungible, but also tradable? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we, so we as an exchange do allow the fractionalization and um, the ability to take NFTs that are absolutely securities and register on our market by prospectus to a global investor. Again, Americans are not allowed to participate in that. Canadians can't participate either. So the concept of fractionalization of asset classes into a digital format as an NFT or a digital security exists in the rest of the world. I think the SEC is doing a good job. They're moving slowly. They're, they're testing. 
And their concerns in certain aspects have, have been validated with what happened in the crypto market. And we saw trillions of dollars lost in, in individual, individual retail investors be harmed. What we're talking about doing here is not a security. This is not a manipulative product. It's not giving equity ownership. It's not doing any of the things that fall under the Howey test. And the Howey test is pretty clear. So it's a situation where I think in time, the SEC is going to recognize that this is a modern technique of couponing. It's a modern technique of communication. The beauty of the blockchain is it makes it uh, to facilitate it and to be able to track who owns what and to be able to have it on a ledger that's transparent and mutable to everybody is really what blockchain is all about. So using you guys as a first step as a coupon to do this, it's a great way to basically, and it's not just because you're doing it as, a, uh, as to all shareholders. There are other initiatives or things that can come of it. We have NFTs that have meet and greets and unlock content and pay-per-view events and, and basically using it as uh, an entry ticket or a key to unlock something. Mm. That's truly what the power of Web3 is. And if you think about it, one of the things that we're going to see, and it's, it's certainly not your first coupon, but if, if everyone truly understands what the power of Web3 is and what an NFT, there's the word metaverse. And it's a whole new world that's coming. And we saw all this you know, hype and nonsense over the last year. And in a bear market, what's happening in crypto is when companies build and companies like ourselves that are evolving the future of being able to communicate, the future of proxying, the future of all aspects in the capital markets, as well as in, in the advertising market and the communication to your shareholders and customers will occur in a metaverse. Might not happen in six months, might be a few years, but it's absolutely going to happen. And these NFTs can communicate into that world. I think the best analogy to say is when we were all kids growing up, we had posters on the wall of our favorite supermodel or actor or athlete in today's modern world, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, those are now the walls. Your pictures that you put up are what those posters were. The future, which is coming very quickly, is the metaverse is now your wall. And the NFT is that communication device that will go out virally. What you're doing with that first step with that coupon is what the future is going to be where it can then communicate around the world. Yeah, absolutely right. And just two quick things on that, uh, because this is a whole area that for us has been really important, in, especially in education, where uh, you know, I think it's, it's somewhere like 25 to 50% of all resumes have got some white lie on them as to do they actually have that certification? Do they actually go to that university? And uh, this is something Vithalak Vitrin talks about in terms of soulbound tokens, which are not things you'll ever sell. Like you know, if you think about an NFT being something you can buy and sell potentially, what we're doing is not something you can buy and sell, but something you can use or something that becomes commemorative as well. Uh, same way, your university degree, right? Or your certification in whatever you're doing, if that's on the blockchain and that's something you're never going to sell because it's yours, but it is something that can easily be verified, that totally changes the way that we start decentralizing education, for example, which is something I'm very interested in. But a second thing is when people really realize the power of fractionalized assets. One of the companies that... Uh, we basically helped to start uh, that I mentored the CEO, Scott Picken, for many years, and he's a great part of our community, is a company called Wealth Migrate, which is in uh, South Africa. And he had the vision of taking commercial grade property, crowdfunding it, uh, linking it all to the blockchain. And that means anyone can come in for even like $1,000 and buy into an actual commercial property and get really great returns on it and then sell their percentage onto someone else as well. Uh, he fell into the same problems that so many other uh, uh, companies have, which is going into this area, there isn't high enough regulation yet. And it just so happened, he's a guy that connected with Emerge because uh -huh. when he basically had Entrepreneur Resort start and we wanted to do fractional ownership, he says, well, why don't you do what I do? I take my commercial properties. I create a public company for each one. Uh, it lists on Merge, which is very forward thinking about this. And basically then everyone's getting effectively shares within that uh, company and they can sell those because it's now traded. The fact that they now, by coincidence, happen to now be working with you uh, when we actually listed Entrepreneur Resource on Merge, I think is super awesome. But that idea that anyone can say, look, you know, with this ownership comes the assets, right? And if I was to sell those on, then I can share with others. And I think people in the future will be even, you know, basically building, you know, you know, taking property and going the same route as Robin Hood, where you can actually take percentages of different assets uh, and earn income off that as well, which I think is very, very powerful. 
And we do that. And, and the beauty of working with Merge is uh, Merge is an established depository, a regulated uh, body, affiliate member of the World Federation of Exchanges. So we can take those assets and actually go back to the U.S. markets and then list them back in a non-tokenized traditional format and back and forth. So we take like what we're doing with you, taking your common stock and putting it into a tokenized or digital form, which is really just it's the same shares. It's a digital representation. But then the efficiencies of what you were saying by having fractionalized ownership of real estate that goes into the blockchain that can be then tracked and dividends can be paid and cash withdrawn and all of it instantaneous without having to go through the traditional banking systems and, and going through those problems of settlement, it just changes it. And that's the future. But we're starting to see it here in the U.S. We have it under Reg A. Uh, Reg A allows that type of activity. It's, it's a quasi registration with the SEC. But it's the it's not the primary issuance. It's what happens afterwards. And the SEC is just not there yet. And, and in time, they'll probably be there. But it doesn't exist where it does exist now on upstream and the rest of the world can now have access to it. And that's an important thing to say. So we are a foreign market. We don't allow Americans to transact today. However, we are in the process of working with the regulatory framework here in the U.S. to allow U.S. broker dealers to introduce customers to our market. And once that happens, it really now creates a one centralized stop, one app that is it's allows any marketplace, any issuer from Toronto, NASDAQ, you with New York, uh, London, ASX, NSX, all these markets to come to one place to be able to get access to all these equities. Sure. It's the future. Cross-border yeah. liquidity, cross-border price discovery. Absolutely. And that's not the reason we decided NFT was the very first way to go with you, because, of course, there's no restriction to Americans or Canadians with that in the same right. way that our shares. So uh, here's an interesting thing, right? We, I was having a conversation when we were looking at how we make this work with Patrick Burns' team, because obviously Patrick did this as really the first to be doing effectively a, a, a blockchain dividend. Uh, it just so happened that we know well the CEO of Medici, which basically are the ones that did this. Ali, we had many conversations with. Uh, and basically the team that put all that together said, hey, this took, it was not overnight. It took basically like, you know, 24 months, millions of dollars, uh, you know, basically going through T0 and it was not easy at all. And of course, uh, uh, you know, you've progressed things at a whole different level. And so I, one thing which I'm hoping people get out of this interview is the future is here now. This is happening now. And as always, the real question is why aren't more people already here having built exchanges like what you're building? And I would love for you to share you know, what your experience at, you know, when you were at bank, right? Like what you already were doing in terms of crowdfunding or really supporting the little guy, the retail investors, uh, and how you, even today with like Horizon, are very focused at like, you know, these different securities apps, which actually improve their technology. Again, not for the big institutions as much as the retail investors, because this is all part of a lifelong journey for you, which then makes you ideally placed for what you're doing right now with Upstream. So you can kind of talk a bit about, you know, what those pivotal moments are that have led you to this. Yeah, so um, so I wear two hats. So I'm the co-founder of Upstream and uh, Horizon, which is the software provider to Upstream. But I also am an investment banker, uh, 30 years on the street. And I just need to disclaim everything I'm saying today now is not in that role of an investment banker. I'm not providing any investment advice. I'm purely talking here as Upstream. But what I had uh, embarked on back in 2012 to 2015 is we had something called the Jobs Act that came out. And it was a great way to create capital formation uh, for entrepreneurs to be able to use modern techniques to communicate directly with investors and utilize the ability to do general solicitation. So the three areas that everybody was focused on was Title II, which is general solicitation of private placements, Title III, which is Reg CF, which is crowdfunding, and Title IV, which was Reg A+, which allowed companies to be able to raise up to $75 million. Originally, it was 50 and now it's increased from their customers and from the crowd using social media and modern techniques. Because when you do an S1 IPO, you go into a quiet period and it's very difficult for an investor to make an informed decision on information that's in the prospectus from months old. Reg A allowed the ability to have real-time communication using real-time techniques, not the black and white prospectus, but actually having social media interactions and ads on Facebook and other types of uh, distribution points to allow then investors to make informed decisions. I modernized that and recognized that this was a great way to bring back the small cap IPO 
and did the first uh, IPO onto the New York Stock Exchange using Reg A, in fact, the only two, and several onto NASDAQ. And what inspired me to create Upstream was that Title III, which was crowdfunding, had a 12-month hold. So all these, there was over $5 billion raised and all these individual investors were, were powering these new entrepreneurial ideas and creating capital formation and innovation. And it was great, but there was no exit. What's the point of buying something? I always say it's like buying, you, you drink all the beer, you drink, uh, eat the bread, but it's nothing other than a charitable donation if you can't get out of it. So my concept was to create a secondary marketplace to allow liquidity in a, an environment and when blockchain came around, we realized what it was, but there was deficiencies that we saw right off the bat in the U.S. There was no KYC AML technology. There was no custody and clearing technology. Most importantly, to facilitate any of this, you need to have the transfer agents on site. And they were all our friends from Wall Street. There was no way they were investing in technology and paying the money to do so on this unproven uh, idea. The other thing is everybody wanted to fractionalize real estate in the U.S., institutions that wrote those types of checks don't want to do that. They want to go the old fashioned way that they're used to. It was too new. So we tried to become an ATS. We worked with the SEC, like all these other market participants, and the SEC and FINRA put out joint statements and, and terms and conditions that they would allow broker dealers to get involved with it. But it still had the problem of not allowing it to be real time. How do you have a marketplace that you can't settle a transaction instantly? How what we saw with Robinhood. If, imagine the, the confusion if, if there was an actively traded market and you didn't even know if you got your fill for hours, days, weeks. It doesn't work. So where the SEC uh, is innovative that they're now looking at this, they're still just not quite ready yet, which is fine. So we went offshore and we built all of the systems necessary to facilitate an orderly market. We have a very robust KYC process. To the consumer, it's a 90 second process. Under the hood, we actually use geofencing and we drop pins in your phone and your metadata. We use liveness detection. We run against 60 international databases, much more than any other KYC provider because we want no bad actors. And we don't want the games of people using VPNs or other playing, you know, trying to manipulate coming in from the US. If you're an American, you're not trading in our market today. We're not willing to risk what we are because we follow these American rules. But then we built technology for the transfer agents and we were able to integrate with a TA. And the exciting thing is we became a stamp medallion guarantor. Most people don't even know what that means. It means that we can stamp a stock power with a medallion guarantee stamp to facilitate a movement into the market. So you asked the question about Patrick, great guy, innovative, very forward thinking, spent two years building it spent millions of dollars. We've spent millions of dollars, almost $25 million building what we built over three and a half years. So we do have a lot of time. You're just coming in at the end for the overnight success. Right. But the, the, the thing about Patrick, the problem that you have is the US market, the plumbing, the DTC system doesn't allow for blockchain. So ultimately what happened with Patrick's dividend is although it was innovative and creative, the actual dividend is not a blockchain-based security. It's an uncertificated share of common stock that uses the blockchain as a courtesy, as a backup. That's not what we do. We take that same uncertificated security, the same rights and, and ownership as any other share of stock, but we digitize it, which is really what the stock market is. It's a non-new issue. We're not diluting your company. We're using existing. So Patrick's shares ended up in, ending up dual listing on the OTC markets. And I don't want to get into the whole short selling uh, side of the things, but if you can borrow securities in the U.S., you can fulfill a short. If the shares are on the OTC markets, it's no different than being in NASDAQ. You can borrow. So his idea was novel. His idea was forward thinking. But ultimately, doing something like that didn't benefit him in the long run. That, that, that was one of the biggest things I noticed when I was looking at all of the different companies and CEOs that have been looking for solutions to all the naked short selling and how to do it is that is that if they had a particular record date, count date to solve something, you, you could see that clearly that, you know, everyone's trying to cover for the naked shorts up until it, but afterwards they just all came back in again. So that's- You just shorted the next day. Exactly. There's a total misconception all the time <laughs> companies come to us and say, if we change our names and change our QSIP, we're going to bust the shorts. I said, think about it this way. If you're the long shareholder and you own stock of XYZ company at your Robinhood account, and the company changes its name in QSIP, and you log in on Monday morning on this new name in QSIP, what happened? The shares are still in your account. 
There's no difference if the company was short, if the shareholder was short. They're short the same shares. So all they did is change the name in QSEF. It doesn't work. Yeah. So it's the most important thing on all of this stuff. is, yeah, having an ongoing ability to keep on, you know, stopping the music, keep on, you know, checking where things are at, you keep on seeing who's actually, you know, real and not and playing the long game, which is what, what I recommend all CEOs do. Obviously, at the end of the day is having a healthy company, having company people want to invest in. But then from there, how do you get the bad actors out? Well, to constantly make it very difficult for them to come in and profit from you because they're not there to help you visit, build your business, right? They're not there for the rest of the investors. They don't take money from the rest of the investors. And so actually at the end of the day, like blockchain is really the only solution uh, where you actually have something which is decentralized. So my next question is about the future because I don't think anyone listening in that is, uh, that is understanding the power uh, of actually having a unique locator online that no one can take away from you, plus the tracking of what's happening with any locator, which is what blockchain allows you to do. Uh, and so, you know, you can't just hide it. You can't just duplicate it. From that, do you, like, I, I see some exchanges like ASX, you know, Singapore is similar as well. So Australia, Singapore, experimenting to see if they could be starting to use the blockchain. But as you mentioned, like, you know, you've got some very complex systems like the entire US system with DTCC, do you think that there will be some of these exchanges that will be able to make this transition and do it effectively? Or do you think? Absolutely. We're already seeing it. Now, NASDAQ has invested heavily into it. Uh, the, the New York has invested heavily into it. ASX, they tried to change their, their settlement systems. It ended up uh, backfiring a little bit on them. Um, and the difficulty is not the, 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 the technology around blockchain, because that's pretty um, clear. It's integrating the old plumbing and basically modernizing your house. You know, think of it that you, you've got a house that was built in the 1800s and your plumbing and your electricity can barely hold the wattage that you need to do modern communications. And now you're coming in with this whole new um, level of, of technology. So you have to kind of rebuild where, where a company like us, we built it from scratch. We didn't build upon something new. And I think in time we're going to see it, but it's not just related to securities. It's related to, the ability to move um, knowledge and data and uh, everything from real estate to you know regular currencies and other types of interesting derivative swaps and things like that. I mean, we we're exploring all that on upstream. We're, we've already been in contact with, with many issuers that are looking to do institutional grade settlement because if you can settle and that the smart contract actually has data within it. The one thing, though, I think that's important for everyone to understand, at least our mantra, and, and when I was back on panels back in the past, I would sit with these very creative technologists, and they would always say the same thing. We're using technology to replace regulation. And I would look at them and say, you're never going to change anybody's mind because we've been doing this way for since 1933, 1934, at least here in the U.S., from a, from a disclosure standpoint. We use technology to enhance regulation. Take existing regulation and make it more efficient, give greater protection to investors, give greater transparency to investors and greater access to information. That's what the blockchain does. It's not going to ever do away. And everyone last year when we were sounding the alarm about commingled accounts and we publish a blog, you can see we were talking about it way before the disasters happened in the crypto market. If you come from a regulated world, it makes sense. The technologists have visions. But they really, they don't even know how to ask, even ask the right questions of settlement and how the plumbing works. So it's a combination of merging those together. That's the future of blockchain and the future of markets. And there's something you said that really interesting, like right now, a lot of your clients, they're the companies, right, that actually want to be, you know, using the system. And in the future, it could be exchanges themselves that come along and want to use your platform and work with you, which I think is great that we can see it that way. And I think another part is we always know with technology, uh, you know, the adoption happens. Uh, when it's very clear that you're doing something that's either faster or cheaper or simpler, right? It's always one of those three things or all of them. And uh, obviously, you know, if there's not the liquidity, then it's really challenging because there's there's pluses and minuses. In the case of uh, one of the the faster one, right? One of the biggest things about the um, weirdness of the markets, this T plus two, right? It's like you were, you were living this technological age. You already mentioned you're T zero. Um, and when people have to wait two days, that actually opens up market manipulation on things like naked short selling as well, where it's like, well, it's not really legal as long as you do it within two days. But then of course it's still naked, right? And so of course, if it's zero, you can't do that anymore, right? Um, no. Do you think the current market, do you think it would take a shift to blockchain with the likes of the US markets 
before it's T plus T zero, or do you think that might come sooner? I think it's coming sooner. I mean, the markets have been heading in that direction for a while. We, you know, years ago it was T three, and it was even longer than that. So we we've seen the adoption, and it will slowly as efficiencies within the the settlement systems get better and better. Uh, I sit on the advisory board of uh, DTC where there's a blockchain initiative where DTC brought in market participants like ourselves, like our firm and others to help give advice because they're trying to make a settlement system using the blockchain. And they're working within the constraints and, and, the, and the limited ability that the SEC is allowing them to do, but they're forward thinking and they're realizing that it is the future. But again, you have so many market participants and so many interlinking aspects of the capital markets that you're not going to change it all into a blockchain marketplace day one, but it will be baby steps. And we've seen the SEC actually bless the Boston Stock Exchange to have some of their record keeping done on the blockchain, which is a great first step. Ultimately, what we do need is the markets to be able to uh, act in a blockchain manner. We're just not there yet. And I still, I think that will be 10, 20 years away, but at least other aspects of settlement and other aspects of record keeping is going to happen a lot sooner than later. I'm really excited by this. I mean, for me, you know, the actual fact that there's been these challenges or problems we have with markets or even just like giving, you know, the ordinary retail investor the same kind of opportunities that big institutions have by just using crowdfunding. These are all things that basically we can see can work and that the fact that blockchain is there as a solution. And now we're actually seeing use cases like I think upstream is one of the best use cases where it's actually now all happening and is here now today and we can actually show how quickly we can move on this as well so I just want to say for all CEOs watching this uh you should be paying attention and obviously all investors go speak to the CEOs that you're investing in and make sure they stay up to date with this as well uh what would be uh final words Mark that you would share with everyone especially if you know there's there's a lot of distrust that's out there in the world. We're living in a world <laughs> now. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and the one thing here, I would say, you say the main things. I would say if a CEO is listening to this, think about what's happened, just even us being here today on Zoom. You know, before COVID, we'd all pick up phone calls and, and have, you know, conference calls. We didn't have live communication. I think COVID has opened the doors where, at least with, even with our firm, we communicate with issuers, investors, and groups around the world. What we're seeing with blockchain and what we're seeing with Upstream is that the barriers and the walls are coming down for marketplaces. There's cross-border liquidity, cross-border price discovery. We're a 20-hour-a-day market. We're not following the U.S. market hours. So we give the ability, and this is, I think, the biggest message I want to send to the CEOs, you have been limited to marketing your securities to U.S. investors. And the U.S. capital markets is the most liquid market in the world, and it's probably the most efficient market in the world. But it's a fraction of the market capability of investors from around the world that want to buy your stock, but just can't. They don't have the capability to open an account and purchase, even if it's $10 worth of stock. Fractionalization of shares, we offer it all. So now you have the ability by listing on Upstream to finally give the rest of the world an opportunity to participate in your success. And that liquidity, that investor diversity, and the ability to offer cross-border price discovery is what the future of the market is. And it's here today. That's very awesome. That's I, I want to just finish with a quick story, which I think you'll find kind of funny, uh, which it got reminded when I when I heard your exchange with Upstream. And it was a story uh, from about a decade ago when my kids were going to the green school in Bali. And uh, we basically had the most beautiful bamboo bridge. That, I mean, this is a very environmental school. There's this bamboo bridge that went across the river and almost like at the ultimate irony, because of global warming, there was this massive monsoon big rocks came down the river and this beautiful bridge just got washed away, right? So just gone. And we basically came, and the road you had to get across to the actual school was like with this big cliff on either side. And we're there going, we can't even get to the school anymore. And we were there with all the kids in the car park. Um, so we're there talking about how do we get a new bridge and how do we even get across and where the kids going to go to school right now? What do the kids do? Well, kids do what kids always do, which is go like explore the river, right? And so off they went. And as they were going up, we we're like, right, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to get across? And of course, upstream, like further up the river, it is much narrower, it's more shallower, you've got more rocks. 
So they'd got upstream, they'd walked across. And so we're there thinking, how are we going to get across? And these kids suddenly appeared on the other side and they were like, hi, mom, hi, dad. <laughs> we're like, oh, they really figured it out. And there's something which I find really interesting about the future, because a lot of people think of the future a bit like the other side of the bridge. It's like, well, there's something out there, but it's not there yet. I've always noticed the future is always someplace like that upstream where it already appears. Like I still remember when I started looking at Silicon Valley days at how does Steve Jobs know Bill Gates? And because at the very beginning, it was a very small number of people when it was still a very small river. And then eventually they became the bridge for all of us. I think that's exactly where we are right now with what's going on with companies, with what's going on with the blockchain is the fact that I know you and most of the people I'm hearing in this space, you already know them too. It's a really small group. Uh, but if we basically all start looking upstream and start thinking, okay, well, who do we need to get to that already are in the future today who are going to be the ones really building the bridges 10, 20 years from now? For sure, you're going to be one of them. For sure, we're going to be doing that in education. And I really hope everyone who's listening, you know, you're in for the ride because I think it's going to be an amazing decade ahead. I love that analogy. And that's exactly why we thought of the word upstream when we were looking to name our company, because we are moving upstream and, and that's the flow is going upstream for all these companies to grow and continue to get bigger. So awesome. Thanks perfect. so much, Mark. It's, we're going to do great things together. And I really hope uh, to it. this is a real great value for everyone. Share it with others as well. Uh, and uh, of course, I'll drop links down below. So anyone of you to get a hold of Mark and the upstream team, you'll know how to do that too. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it, Roger.